All right. Well, good morning. Thank you guys uh, for coming back. It's great to see you all again. I know it's there's never really a good time uh, in your day to do this, but uh, the fact that you're stepping away um, for this quick hour is very telling uh, to us. So we want to make sure we get going here pretty quick. We have um, a quick hour on classroom behavior management, um, just to kind of give you some tools that you can hopefully use uh, in as quick as possible in your classroom to help support you, support those kids. Um, today we have Tom Stacko. He is a SST consultant as well as um, does some consulting outside of the SST world. But uh, we think you will uh, really enjoy his uh, quick hour today and hopefully um, confident you will get some tools that you can use in your classroom. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to throw them in the chat box. And I know it's a quick hour, so we will um, we are always available to offer um, you know, technical assistance or any questions you might have afterwards, just you can email us um, or Tom directly and uh, we will help get you that support. But thank you for being here again. If you have questions, throw them in the chat box and we will get them out there. And uh, floor is yours, Tom. Okay, thanks so much. I'm so lucky to be joined by my colleagues, uh, Aaron, Kim and Steve uh, this morning to talk about classroom management in one hour. Can you believe it? How can we do that? Well, I'm going to try to prove it to you because when we talk about classroom management, we really want to talk about the basics, what every educator from pre-K to grade 12 does on a regular basis in their classrooms. And for some of this, we might be a little quick review. For some of us, it might be new. But the bottom line is when we talk about classroom behavior management, a lot of us are on a journey to make sure that we have the skills under our belt as we continue in this great profession of being an educator. Okay. So in the chat box, tell me how you're feeling this morning. Hey, it's Friday. In the chat box, let me know how you're feeling this morning. I need to know. In the chat box. Oh, tired, Nick. Oh, my gosh. It's Friday. Well, I totally understood. Chippy. Oh, that's good. Tired as well. Frazzled. Whoa, overwhelmed. My coffee didn't work. Oh, ready for the weekend. I hear you. Game day. You got that straight. Homesick for my kiddos, need some more coffee. I got some here, right here. Happy it's Friday. I'll tell you, I agree with you. <laughs> so it is a long week. Uh, obviously, being an uh, educator uh, during this time is very difficult, but I appreciate you being here and giving me your undivided attention this morning. What we want to do in a very short amount of time, and I'll introduce myself again momentarily, is we want to talk about the basics of good classroom behavior management. Whether you're a regular teacher, a special ed teacher, whatever, we want to make sure that you and I have the basics under our belt to move forward with what we need to do, how we need to learn these skills to move forward. And of course, we know as educators, we want to use evidence-based practices, things that have been proven to be rather successful to make sure that we're moving in the right direction. We're also going to introduce an acronym to you this morning. We can't do a PD education a PD without talking about acronyms. The new acronym that we're going to share today is called STOIC, and Stephen, again, put that handout that we're going to refer to uh, many times throughout this hour in the chat box, so make sure that's open on your browser. And that STOIC stands for Structuring for Success, Teaching Expectations, Observing, Interacting Positively, and Obviously Correcting. So that handout for those people that were able to open it looks like this, and as you kind of gleam through this particular uh, checklist, this is a self-assessment for you, okay? So in the middle column, there are many behaviors, adult behaviors that you and I do in the special ed classroom or working with all kids in our building that we need to try to move forward with. And our quick goal this morning is to try to tackle some of these big ideas under good structure, under good teaching of behavior, under good observing and monitoring, under good interacting positively, and correcting fluently. Give me a thumbs up if that framework for this hour will work for you, will be influential. Good, and I appreciate that because that really makes a lot of sense. Before we get into it, we're gonna set up some behavioral ex expectations. And I know you probably do this on a regular basis in your classrooms with your kids. So today, if you're gonna be talking, I would appreciate for the most part, if you have a question or comment, put it in the chat box. Most of us need to be muted, obviously. Make sure your camera's on, we do appreciate that. If you need some type of help or question, put it in the chat box. I'm also going to give you my personal phone number. I have no idea why I'm going to do that. But if you have a question about the content, you could text me at that particular number. Okay. 
The activity today is kind of learning the basics of good classroom management under the STOIC acronym. Movement is pretty much at your seat and area today. So we're not gonna really take any breaks, but if you need to move around, make sure that camera's on so I could see you. Participation, you're listening, you're reflecting upon the content. If you do all these things I'm asking you to do with this hour, we're all gonna be successful. Does that make sense? All right, how many people set clear expectations before they start an activity or transition with their kids? How many people need to do more of that on a regular basis? And I appreciate that because we are not doing everything we need to do and we're on that journey. In the chat box, I wanna, want you to tell me how many years have you been an educator? So come up with a number. How many years have you been an educator? 15, 5, 8, 11, 15, 2, 3, 6, year one. Welcome to the club. Congratulations. Thanks, Isabel. Great. Alina, thanks for joining the club here today. All right. So we've got a lot of folks that are kind of new to the profession. We've got some veterans out there as well. So when I, when I think about what we're gonna talk about today, some of this for our new folks is gonna be new material. Some of that stuff you might've learned in undergrad or graduate school, some of it you may not. Some of our veterans have done this, but we gotta make sure that we are doing maintenance on our classroom management practices every quarter or every month. We're doing maintenance, right? Because we're pro professionals, that's what we do. So we wanna make sure that with this information is applicable all the way from the pre-K teacher in my audience today, all the way to a 12th grade teacher, okay? So keep that in mind as we move forward here. The cool thing about classroom management is it's been around for years. The research about classroom management has been around for decades. And really, if you really think about it, a lot of it hasn't changed. And when you glance at that slide, and I know you can't read everything, the fact is you and I set up clear expectations. We teach those rules and expectations relentlessly day in and day out. We constantly reinforce kids who are doing the right thing. And when we do correct kids, we have to do it fluently because we wanna keep instructional uh, progress moving in the right direction. We are good supervisors. We constantly observe what's working in our classroom with our kids and what's not. And when it's not working, we are problem solvers. That's what the research says about good classroom managers. And you'll find the best administrators at your building, the best counselors, the best school psychs, the best teachers, the best special ed teachers, know this information and constantly move forward with it. When we think about classroom management, we are not great at dealing with tough behavior. We're not great at dealing with tough behavior, but you know what you and I are great at? Prevention. Before that kid you know, has a chance to make a poor choice, we are preventing misinformation, misbehavior from occurring in the first place. In the chat box, tell me what you do on a regular basis to prevent misbehavior right when the kids come into your room in the morning. What do you do in the classroom to prevent misbehavior even from occurring? Tell me in the chat box. You keep them busy, that makes good sense. You model those behaviors you're looking for. You have routines. Heather, Eric, you're just knocking it out of the park this morning. Veronica, Megan, oh my gosh. You guys should be doing this presentation, not me. We know that those are the basic things that educators do. The bottom line is, and again, thanks for all your participation there, you and I cannot make a student learn. We cannot make them behave. All we could do is push the buttons, turn the knobs, move the levers of our words, our actions, our structures in our classroom to set the stage for misbehavior, right? Now, before we get into it, I heard you guys don't have any misbehavior in your classrooms. Is that right? Yeah, right. So we know misbehavior occurs in so many different types of levels. Some are hot and heavy, some are less frequent. In the chat box, let me know what current behavior problems are being exhibited in your classroom as we speak. Do you have a, sub you have a substitute today? <laughs> um, tell me what type of behavior problems. Disruption, says Christina, refusal to work, gaslighting. Oh, that's a good one. We haven't heard that one for a while. Aggression, reactive behavior, attention-seeking behavior. Boy, you guys are great. Sarah, way to go. Jillian, thank you. Nick, oh, Katie, attention-seeking as well. Complete shutdown, I hate that. Refusal to work, I believe you. And when we think about these things that our, our colleagues are telling us, we know that disrespect, non-compliance, those disruptions, they eat away at instructional time, right? 
But the bottom line is a lot of us are constantly on that journey as we speak. And I would never say I have all the answers of good classroom management, but I love this subject very much. I'm a special ed teacher working with behavior disorder kids for many, many years, a school psychologist in the Cleveland schools. You know, I've seen everything under the sun. And again, when I think about classrooms and buildings, we got to make sure that we're setting ourselves and our principals and our paraprofessionals and our secretaries and our custodians up for success by making sure that you and I have all those basic ideas. But the bottom line is how prepared are you to deal with behavior management as you continue in this profession? In the chat box, let me know how many classes in behavior management have you had in undergrad or graduate school? One, 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 zero, one. So I'm hearing mostly one and twos, is that enough? Is that enough? I don't think so either. And again, we got to make sure that we're constantly moving forward. And it's really true that a lot of our new teachers, brand new to the field, brand new to the building, sometimes leave the profession within the first five years because they say to themselves, you know what? I never thought it was going to be this way. How many people raised your hand in the field today? I never thought teaching school would be like this. Anybody feel that way besides me? It's, it's hard, isn't it? We got a lot of accountability and stuff. So when we think about behavior management, we got to make sure that we have the tools to try to minimize these behaviors in the first place. And that's kind of what we're looking at, okay? So when we think about this behavior management approach, sometimes we do know that historically, some educators have been more negative, more reactive, and more exclusionary when dealing with those tough kids, right? And you and I are not robots by any means. But when we have what we call simple solutions to deal with misbehavior, I think we're missing the boat. So let's take a look at these simple solutions real quick. One simple solution that some educators, possibly like you and me, excuse me, still do on a regular basis, is what we have an over-reliance on role-bound authority. And what that basically means is this. I'm the teacher. You're the kid. You need to follow my rules. Well, that is true. I am the teacher. You are the kid. But some of our kids don't have this idea of symbolic power. You're not my teacher. I'm not going to listen to you. Oh, you're going to send me to the principal? Go ahead. I want to sit on that long wooden bench. How many people know what I'm talking about there? All right. So when we only are using role-bound authority, you need to follow my rules. Some kids say, big deal, right? So we got to keep that in mind. Another simple solution that some educators still rely on, not you necessarily, is what we call an over-reliance on emotional intensity, using emotion to make kids follow directions, the threat of consequences to make kids follow directions, stern voices to make kids follow directions. Again, nothing's wrong with that, but if we're doing that all the time and we're getting the same results, is it working? Don't tell anybody this, but my blood pressure is more important than the kid's blood pressure. It really is. So the way I come across really makes the difference. I see uh, Kale shaking his head. He knows what I'm talking about. So take a look at this uh, stage video here and see how this adult is trying to use emotional intensity to make this kid behave. Jake, you need to clean up that mess on the floor before I can excuse you. Why should I have to? Why don't you pick it up? Because I am not your personal maid. You pick it up and you do it now. I don't have to do what you say. Oh, yes, you do. And you do it right now. Who do you think you are, the cafeteria queen? Don't you talk to me like that, young man. You get down on that floor. You clean it up right now. Make me, you ugly win. All right, that is enough. You get yourself down to the office now, and you are in big, big trouble. <laughs> How many people have seen a scenario like that in your building in the past? <laughs> I see a lot of hands being raised. Now, before I continue, that kid said, you can't make me, you ugly witch. I would never show anything inappropriate during the workday, but that's what he said, okay? Now, is that kid responsible for his own behavior? Should he have followed that direction? I think he should have. But did that teacher, did that adult escalate the behavior? In the chat box, tell me what that adult did to make the behavior worse. What did that adult do to make that behavior worse from that kid? She did several things. She went back and forth. She got into a power struggle, Sarah says. Way to go, Heather. Way to go, Nick. Veronica, thanks. Where to begin? That's a good one. Right. I mean, 
These are all great answers. So when we think about our dealing with behavior management, a lot of it goes back to me and what I can control. Another simple solution that some of us still rely on is what we call an over-reliance on consequences and punishment. So no one's saying we're getting rid of consequences and punishment, but if that's all we're doing to help kids behave better, I think we're missing the boat. I don't know if you know this about me, but when I drive down I-71, I speed sometimes. And you know what? I've gotten tickets before, consequences. And you know what? I still speed, right? So consequences alone doesn't stop behavior or doesn't change behavior. Teaching, monitoring, and providing feedback you know, changes behavior. And so that's something we got to keep in mind. Another simple solution is wishing and hoping the problems will go away. Have you ever heard this? I hear they're moving. Do these kids ever move? And if they do move, what happens two weeks later? They come yeah. back, right? Right? Or please let her be absent one more day. Please, 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 right? And again, that's the type of thing. So when I think about some of these simple solutions, I want you to identify one, if any, that might be a still alive with you or with your colleagues within your building. Let's talk about them because they're not here today. Are any of these simple solutions still alive possibly with you or in your building? Let me know if any in the chat box. Are any of those still alive with the emotional intensity and the robot authority? Thanks, Sarah, appreciate that. Robot authority is still out there a little bit, all of, all of the above, okay? Right, and again, you and I are, are, you know, are, are learning some of these skills as we speak, and I appreciate all the comments in here. All right, so when we talk about behavior management, we want to go through the basics. Now, I'm going to put a comment on the, on the screen here, and you tell me if you agree with this. For student behavior to change, adult behavior needs to change first. Now, this is when I get tomatoes thrown at me. So since you can't throw tomatoes at the screen, let me know. All right, so most of us are agreeing with that. Now, it always means to say that kids are responsible for their own behavior. Don't get me wrong, they need to be accountable. But a lot of behavior change starts with the way I talk, the way I structure, the way I teach, the way I observe, the way I interact, and the way I correct, right? A lot of that, and me and every other teacher in the building, there we go back to that infamous STOIC acronym. In a perfect classroom behavior management setting, either with intervention specialists, paraprofessionals, regular teachers, you and I need to structure for success, teach explicitly the behaviors we're looking for, observe and monitor constantly, interact positively as much as we can, and when we do correct, we gotta correct fluently, right? And that's the whole idea. So if I went into your classroom next week and I came up to you, Haley, and said, Haley, how do you structure for success? You would probably rattle off a zillion things that you do. If I said, Amanda, how do you interact positively with your kids? She'd rattle off a zillion things that she did. You know, when I talked to Eric, he'd say, you know, how do you observe? You, he'd say, I walk around the room. I constantly tell kids and remind kids what they need to be doing and praise them when they are. Those are the type of things that we're looking for. So when we talk about the STOIC, which again is reflected in our handout today, and Steve, feel free, feel free to put that back in there for some of our latecomers today if you want to. Structuring for success means a zillion things, doesn't it? We, the way we come in the room, our, we, the way we set our classroom rules up, you know, what our routines and procedures are, you know, how we deal with late assignments, right? how we interact when kids, when they're not following directions. Structure, structure, structure is a big, big word. And you know what? When I think of structure, I think of Disneyland. Disneyland is the epitome of good structure. How do you get thousands of people in, the, in, a, in Disneyland in the middle of July in 110 degree weather to wait two hours for a roller coaster? If you're not structured, you're in big, big problems, right? So uh, make sure you're... Um, Thank you for that. Um, so structure, like I said, is a very large word. It means so many different things. Structuring at an elementary level, a middle school level, and a high school level could be a little bit different. 
But the bottom line is we know that structure uh, is so important. It's kind of a no brainer, but some of us need to relook at the structures that we have created to see if they're still alive as they once were in August, right? And again, structures could be our classroom schedule, how we follow the classroom schedule, that's structure, right? Um, in this particular building, where do they need structure? <laughs> you got it, they need it in the restroom, right? So all these teachers did a pre-correct before the kids went to the restroom and obviously use that mantra, go flush, wash, leave on a regular basis. So structure means so many things and we'll talk about that in a second. T in Stoics talks about teaching explicitly what we want, right? So our preschool teachers, our kindergarten teachers, our first grade teachers, they are masters at teaching behavior. But does our middle school teachers need to teach behavior? Does our high school teachers need to teach behavior, right? And especially with the pandemic that occurred, kids were out of the, way, out of the building uh, interacting for two or three years. So teaching how to interact, how to work together, how to sit at a table, all that stuff. How many people know what I'm talking about there? All right. So again, the whole idea here is how are we aware of how we're constantly teaching and reteaching the behavior that we need? The O obviously stands for observing and monitoring. The best uh, intervention specialists in my group today are constantly up on their feet, praising kids, walking around as much as they can. That's why you and I are exhausted at the end of the day. We want to make sure we're constantly looking at what we need to do. So if we expect certain behaviors, our classroom rules, our routines, our directions, whatever we want, we have to constantly inspect them, constantly, right? Because we got to make sure that we have a flavor of how many kids are doing what we need to do and the kids that are not, what are we going to do differently to try to support them? The I is, stands for interact positively. This is probably what you and I are fantastic at. That's why we're educators in the first place. We are constantly acknowledging kids as much as we can when they do what they need to do. And when you and I have clear expectations, it's very easy to interact positively and to acknowledge what, they, what they're doing well. I'm a big fan of the word um, acknowledgement. I don't like the word reward. I just don't care for that word. I like acknowledgement. I like encouragement. Uh, I like feedback. I like reinforcement. Those are the words I like. Reward sounds like, oh, if you do that, I'll give you a sticker. Well, you know, that has its place too, but we get acknowledged. So just as you and I get a paycheck in our checking account every two weeks, that's our acknowledgement. And us as self-regulated adults, we could wait two weeks before we get our payoff, right? Right? <laughs> so we want to make sure we do that. The C stands for correcting fluently. So we know in a perfect world, we want to correct kids to keep that instructional flow going, right? We want to do it briefly, calmly, immediately, and semi-privately uh, if possible. So again, easier said than done, but that's kind of what we're looking for. So if you go back to your handout this morning, you know that this self-assessment checklist that you have in front of you is divided up into STOIC with adult behaviors in the middle to kind of say, this is strongly suggested to be part of your repertoire. Does that make sense? All right. And again, this is private. This is none of my business. This is nobody else's business. This is what you are doing to be the best intervention specialist and how the SST 11 is trying to support you in this work. How am I doing, Steve? Is everything going good, you think? All right. So what we want to do is we want to go through some of these ideas real quick in our short uh, 35, 36 minutes left that we have together. So we're going to go under some certain behaviors, adult behaviors, under the STYC in our short amount of time together. So the S obviously stands for structuring for success. And when we talk about structuring for success, as I said a few minutes ago, it's a very broad word, right? So the way this teacher structures for success, I mean, she has two groups going there, doesn't she? She's got a group at the table. Those kids had to learn how to come to that table. Those kids had to learn what to do at the table. Those kids had to learn where to put their feet at the table. Those kids had to know where to put their hands at the table. Those kids know how to need to follow the teacher's directions at the table during that destruction. Some of those kids came in with those prerequisite skills. Some of those kids probably did not. Is that a fair assessment, right? 
be it in elementary, middle, or high school, we have the same type of story. How about those kids in the back being not supervised, right? So those kids who are supposedly working independently needed to be structured for success there as well about what they need to do, what they knew, need to do if they had a question, what their voice tone might have been at, at that table, where their hands and feet need to be, you know, what movement was all about. So structure, as you could see, comes in a lot of shapes and sizes. In the chat box, tell me how I structured for success during our time this morning thus far. How did I, Tom Stacco, structure for success thus far? Let me know in the chat box. I set some champs expectations. I went on my expectations first. I had clear expectations. Thanks, Alina, for clarifying that. Good. I talked about the expectations. Good. And I gave you a handout, right? Good, excellent. Those are the type of things I did. Now, if I didn't do that, what would happen? Boom, we'd have problems. So again, I know reinforcing to all of us, but the thing, the thing is we got to keep in mind. We also know that virtual teachers need to structure for success as well. So when we talk about setting expectations or structure, the first thing I want to talk about very briefly, and again, thanks for all the comments in the chat box. I really appreciate that. We got to talk about our classroom roles. Presently, whatever, you know, uh, arena that you're in, do you have classroom rules that are work for you? That's an open-ended question. Now look at this teacher. She's been teaching for 50 years. These were her classroom rules. Tell me in the chat box what's wrong with her classroom rules. In the chat box, tell me what's wrong with her classrooms. There are way too many, says Kay. I agree. Sarah says too many. They all start with no from Michelle. Oh my, Moses says they're negative. You got that straight, right? So we want to make sure that we're looking for the big idea about classroom rules. Now, when I talk about classroom rules, there's many recommendations. And my strong recommendation is when we create or tweak our classroom rules, notice how I use the word tweak. You still have the ability to do that in the month of October, by the way. We always want to tell the kids what we want them to do as opposed to what we don't want them to do. Now, it doesn't mean you can't say no and stop, and I told you not to. The bottom line is we always want to tell the kids what we want them to do as opposed to what we want, uh, don't want. Who needs to work on that skill as we speak? And I appreciate that. Good for you. And again, it doesn't mean you can't say no and stop and don't. I want to make sure. So when we talk about classroom rules, in the big picture, we always want to make sure that they're stated positively. Like I said, we want to make sure that we tell kids what we want them to do. They got to be observable. I got to see them. Can I see respect? Respect means a zillion things. Can I see it? I don't think I can because it means a zillion things, right? Do I want kids to be responsible? Of course I do. But can I see responsibility as a classroom rule? That's, that's a question that we got to ask ourselves. All these rules got to be taught, practiced, and rehearsed at nauseum. All these classroom rules have to be taught, practiced, and rehearsed at nauseum. Every day, every hour, every week, every other week, it's up to you and decided about your building, right? But if you have kids that are considered behavioral concerns, they got to be taught, practiced, and rehearsed at nauseum. How many people need to do more of that for the coming before Christmas? All right, four people, great. <laughs> Good. And those are the type of things. We want them posted. And we want to make sure they follow the AMPUA acronym. I'm going to give you another acronym. When you have classroom rules, we want to make sure that they follow what's called the AMPUA acronym. And feel free to use the word AMPUA with a cold beverage on a Friday night with your colleagues, by the way. AMPUA stands for observable. I got to see the rules. I got to see them. I can't see respect, right, necessarily. They got to be measurable. I could count them. All my special ed teachers know what observable and measurable is, right? You constantly write that stuff on your IEPs. They got to be positively stated, understandable. So the wording of your classroom rules has to be appropriate for my preschoolers, my kindergartens. Do first grade kids know what the word appropriate means? Do first grade graders know what the word appropriate means? I'm not sure. You have to make that determination. And they always got to be applicable. Always applicable is the A in the Impua. 
When I was a classroom teacher, one of my classroom rules was raise hand to speak. And when I think back, my kids always didn't have to raise their hand to speak. You know, sometimes they did, sometimes they didn't. So was it always applicable, the A and M PUA? No, it wasn't. So if I went back in time, I would cross out raise hand to speak as a classroom rule for me because my kids didn't always have to raise their hand to speak. Sometimes they did, sometimes they didn't. Does that make sense? Okay, so classroom rules are something that we want kids to do 24 seven and they're applicable 24 seven. How about this one? Is this a good classroom rule? Respect others. Does that follow the MPUA acronym? The answer is no, it doesn't. Now, the bottom line, I agree, I agree, Nick, it's kind of vague. Now, some of our kids get it. They understand what I'm talking about if that's a classroom rule. Some of my kids, it's too broad because we know that respect in the classroom might be totally different than what's respectful in the community or at home, right? There's two differences right there as we speak, okay? And again, Chelsea, good comment there as well. How about this one for a classroom rule? Is this a good one? No profanity allowed. Of course, I don't want the kids to swear, duh. But how could I rephrase that? Oh, that's a good question in the chat box. How could I rephrase that to be a classroom rule in a more pop, I'm following the MPUA acronym? Use kind words, says Megan and Sarah. That sounds like a great start to me. You guys are right on the ball there. All right. So just thinking about your classroom rules is kind of what I want you to do this morning, okay? Three to six are easy to remember. Mrs. Felter, thanks so much. Positively stated and posted. That's kind of what we're looking for. With this short little summary of classroom rules, who's going to rethink their classroom rules from now till uh, Christmas? Anybody going to rethink their classroom rules? And I appreciate that because that's what educators like you and I do. We're constantly thinking about what's working and what's not working. It's as simple as that. All right. Um, another area under structure, remember we're under S in stoic, is obviously our room arrangement, right? How space communicates. So we want to make sure that's something that you and I can manipulate, how we arrange our desks, what our traffic patterns in our, in our particular building, okay, in our classroom. Uh, do we have a time away area and different things like that? So when I think of classroom physical space, I think of, again, another acronym, the VAT acronym. I want to make sure I could see everybody. I want to make sure uh, resources are accessible. And I want to make sure that my um, desks and um, the way I arrange my room is, is uh, directly related to the tasks I do. So when I think of visibility, you know, I want to make sure that I could see every kid at all times in my classroom, right? I want to give the illusion to the kid in the back that I could get back there within seconds. Even though I can't, I wanna give the illusion that I could get to the back of the room very quickly. And if I'm up and about doing that, I'm gonna be able to do that as well. Obviously accessibility, where are the materials? Can I get the materials? Can the kids get the materials? You know, just the way it looks. And sometimes as we talk about the essence structure, you know, making sure that might we have some supports with some visuals, like some examples that you see here on the on the screen. And I'm not saying you need to do this. Really adds a little bit of order and structure to your physical space. It may look elementary, whatever. But I've seen this done in the high school too, because if kids are not in their right area or desks aren't arranged in the right area, then I think we're missing the point. So many of us, obviously, who go to grocery stores. Uh, we know that these are type of things that help our people stay in, in place as well. So again, the way we structure for success with our physical space comes in handy as well. You and I know that what we want to do with classroom management is be able to manipulate the situation to increase the probability kids will do the right thing. Room arrangement is something that we could do that is proactive to support positive behavior. So just glancing at some of these examples of room arrangements, some have their pros, some have their cons, but we do know that this teacher um, or teachers kind of make sure that their uh, desks and chairs are arranged with the type of lessons that we do. So if I do a lecture, 
you know, in front of the group, kids are facing me. If I do small group, if I do independent work, how are things arranged? Some of us have the ability to move things around. Some of us don't, but it's something that we got to keep in mind as well. Another area under the essence stoic, which is essential, is what we call an attention signal. Again, something that's something very common. But the bottom line is when we talk about an attention signal, I want to get the kids quiet and still within five seconds. And you'll find the most positive, proactive intervention specialist in front of me before they start an activity or end an activity. They use their attention signal to get the kids quiet and still before they give that next direction. And one way to do that is using what's called a <coughs> signal. The recommended components of an attention signal is to one to have a visual and auditory component to it. I'm not necessarily telling you to change your attention signal, but the question, open-ended question to you is, if the one you have how long does it take the kids to get quiet, okay? Most of my colleagues here will probably say within five to 10 seconds. Some of my colleagues here might, might say, you know, 45 seconds, and you'll have to decide if that's appropriate for you. So another recommendation is to make sure that we do have one that we could give in any location. Obviously in the classroom, how about the hallway? How about at the assembly? How about when we go to that first field trip? Does your attention signal work? And that's the type of thing that we're looking for. So the one that you see there on the screen is this person going, may I have your attention, please? You could hear it and you could see it with my hand going up. So this particular middle school teacher is ready to start a new lesson. He gives his attention signal and obviously all the kids are, have their eyes and ears looking at that particular teacher. So the question is, if we wanna make sure that we're maximizing instruction in our classroom, we got to make sure that our attention signal is up and running. It's functional. It needs to be taught, rehearsed, and practiced at nauseum to maximize the amount of time in the classroom for that for those IEP goals and objectives or the curriculum that we're teaching. So whatever your attention signal is, I want you to just pat yourself on the back for if, if it's working. And if it's not, it's kind of on the to-do list to, to, to move in that particular direction. How many people believe that just given the short summary of an attention signal is something that we need to work on a little bit harder before Christmas? Okay, I appreciate that. I really, really do. And if I was sitting with you, I'd raise my hand as well. Another quick area that we need to talk about is beginning and ending routines. Has this ever happened to you at the end of class? Oh gosh, look at the time. Kids, period's over. Okay, get your stuff together. All right. Oh, wait, wait a second. Go, go. Coyley, I forgot to give you, don't forget you have the field trip forms. Your parents have to sign them. I need them back by Friday. Everybody take one of these, please. Mrs. Gerard, I think I lost my class. Look, I don't have time to deal with that right now, okay? I've got another class coming in here. Oh, kids, don't forget, put your desk back, please. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Don't be late for your next class. <laughs> How many people has happened to you thus far this school year? <laughs> hey, we all have, right? So we do know that you know uh, procedures um, uh, about how the kids come in the room, how they leave the room, how they get ready for lunch, how they come back from lunch. Those are all things that need to be taught, practiced, and rehearsed at nauseum. So just glancing at the slide, these are kind of the basic things. How do kids enter the room? Do you have, do you have a practice way of doing that? All the way from the elementary, middle to high school. You know, what, are, what are they supposed to do when you know, the intercom comes on? How do you deal with tardy students? What's your procedure for that, right? How do you deal with kids who don't have right materials? We want to make sure that we have an answer for that and maximize our time with instruction. So again, lots of different ways to look at it, but the bottom line is it really sets the tone of what you need to do. Setting the tone from the very first day of school is the most important thing you can do as a teacher. <laughs> The first thing that everyone needs to understand is that you are in charge of your classroom. The very best teachers, when you walk into their classroom, it seems like the kids are totally in charge. They're doing everything they want to do all the time. That's been set up by the teacher from the very first day of school. Okay, can I have your attention, please? You have to set the tone before any child ever walks into your classroom. Welcome to the first day of Algebra 1. When you walk into the room, you need to do so quietly and without talking. I'll say that one more time. Quietly 
and without talking. So when a kid walks into your classroom, they have to know what you expect, what you need them to do, and they need to be able to do it. Your expectations are what you allow them to do. Not what you say, but what you allow them to do. So if you say, walk into the classroom quietly, and they walk into the classroom and they're quietly talking to each other, that's what you expect them to do. So don't go back later on and think, man, I wish they came in the classroom without talking at all. You didn't expect that of them from the very first day of school. If I see someone talking, even a whisper, even a giggle, we're going to stop, we're going to come back out, and we're going to practice it and try it again. I'm telling them from the start, and then I'm holding them to that. If they aren't going to do what I ask them to do, we're going back out and we're practicing, and we're going to do it over and over and over. I've had classes where I had to do it 15 times on the first day until they realized what my expectations were. Once they realized what they were, now I only have to do it twice or three times the next day. And then hopefully after that, we can only do it once. Okay, when you walk through this door, it's time to work. All right, let's make it happen. When they walk in this classroom, it's time to work. Clap once, clap once. We can goof around sometimes, we can have fun. But we're going to stop it whenever the teacher wants us to, and we're going to get back to work. Clap twice. Simple as that. Let's get to work. But the key is get them in, get them in quickly, and set the expectation before the first class ever starts. Welcome to the first day of Algebra 1. Okay, so no one's saying you'd have to be like him, but the bottom line is this. He makes an interesting point. What we teach and practice ad nauseum with our kids to do and what we allow them to do could be two different things, right? And that's the thing about maintenance with our classroom management approach. So this particular teacher is basically saying what I taught them to do, but what I allow them to do could be two different things. And I could get myself in a pickle with that. All right. As of this Friday, how many people have gotten themselves into a pickle thus far this school year? Basically saying that I taught the kids to do this, but I'm allowing this and now I got a problem. How many people know what I'm talking about there? All right. And I raise my hand too, right? And it's really hard because we're exhausted. We have so many things on our plate, but that's why behavior managers like you and me constantly are giving ourselves maintenance and patting ourselves on the back to make sure we're trying to do the best thing we can for kids and our structures in our room. One of the last things I briefly want to talk about under the S in stoic is the better instructor you are, the better teacher you are, the better it is for behavior management. Some of us are excellent with our curriculum and our goals and objectives on the IP. Some are on a journey to be a great instructor of academics. But the bottom line is the better and better you get, the better it is to minimize behavior problems. And we could spend the whole day talking about what educators, intervention specialists do on a regular basis to be the greatest academic leader that they could be, as you could see some of the garbly goop on the slide there. Those are things that we learned in undergrad or graduate school or our, our administrators are trying to teach us to do in the classroom. Again, we're not going to spend time, but one thing I do want to spend time real briefly on is what we call your interactions with kids, your perky pace. Take a look at this. That's the only way. Ms. Cosgrove, Ms. Cosgrove, wild night last night, huh, Ms. Cosgrove? <laughs> Listen, try to stay with us for the class. This is money. You know, you don't want to waste your money. Speaking of money, the economic structure that was set up and put in place in the United States after the Industrial Revolution became a kind of, what's the word? Uh, Miss Cosgrove. Miss Cosgrove. Wow. Wild night. Man, did you go to sleep at all? We in here watching you sleep. I see you laughing, but I. I don't even think you know what the hell I'm talking about at this point. All right, hang in there, Ms. Cosgrove. We got a lot to go through. Now, once the funding structures were allocated to different proximities within the economic structure itself, that's when the U.S. government started to allocate different funding programs to... All right, how many people have Ms. Cosgrove's in their classroom? <laughs> right, we all do. So the thinking here is we got to make sure that we're constantly active, having active participation as much as we can. And the real quick thing I just want to quickly mention is your, the way you come across, the way you deliver your instruction is really important to keep kids engaged and obviously minimizing behavioral concerns. So there's a funny term out there called the having a perky pace. 
And I love that term perky pace because I never forget it. It's really kind of, sounds kind of silly. But a teacher like you and me who has a perky pace teaches with passion and enthusiasm. Now, what passion and enthusiasm means to me versus you could be totally different. But the kids know if you have a perky pace. Your students on your roster know whether you teach with passion and enthusiasm, right? And because you make the dullest thing the coolest thing on earth, right? Through your words and actions. So no one's saying you have to be a clown up there, don't get me wrong. But the bottom line is you have a good sense of who you are, a good sense of your curriculum, how interested you are in what we're doing on a daily basis with your kids, be it structures or teaching or academics, whatever. In the chat box, tell me if Tom Stacco has a perky pace. In other words, do I teach with passion and enthusiasm for our quick hour together? Oh, thank God. Thank the Lord. Good. <laughs> so again, something in by raising your hand, let me know if you're if you're on the journey to have a perky pace. Are you on the journey to have a perky pace? And I appreciate that. Way to go. Um, all right. We're doing good here. One of the last things I really want to talk about is a schedule. Um, we do know, again, kind of the basics of good structures to have an efficient daily schedule. Is it safe to say some of your kids live a very unpredictable lifestyle at home or in the community? Is that a safe assumption for some of your kids? So we owe it to them during the day to try to be on schedule, to have a schedule, to make reference to the schedule on a regular basis. And again, we could spend a whole hour talking about what a schedule could look like and sound like. But the bottom line is we want to make sure you make reference to the schedule. And staying on schedule is something that we really, really got to keep in mind. When I was an educator like you, an intervention specialist, I had a bunch of behavior disorder kids. And one of the things my principal told me to do is, Tom, you got to keep these kids on schedule. They have a very unstructured lifestyle at home. So I was constantly making reference to the schedule and the clock. I put my schedule by the clock and I constantly made reference to what the schedule said versus what the clock says, because some of my kids didn't have an, any idea how to read a clock, right? I see a lot of, I see Audrey ready, uh, shaking her head there. She knows what I'm talking about. So when I saw two kids who were not following directions or starting to get at it, I said something like this, Marco, when you do something like this, you're not staying on schedule and we have to stay on schedule. And after two or three weeks, after talking about the schedule, my students used to come up to me and say, Mr. Stacko, please stop talking about that schedule. And that's when I knew I had him hook, line, and sinker. Don't tell anybody this. Half of behavior management is wearing the kids down. Half of behavior management is wearing the kids down. And this is one of many ways I wore my kids down. My classroom rules, my schedule, my structures, my directions, whatever. But the more I stay on task about what's important is kind of what we're looking for, right? <laughs> Chelsea makes a funny comment in the chat box. Thanks for that. So again, something to keep in mind as we move forward. When we finish up here, the T in Stoic talks about teaching expectations, right? It's kind of a no-brainer. If I have certain procedures or rules or expectations or classroom rules, I got to teach them over and over and over and over again. We can't expect, obviously, kids uh, to know uh, what, what they need to do. So in some cases, some educators like you and me have, may have said, you know what? These students are old enough to know how to behave. They're seventh graders. They should know how to behave. Well, of course they should. They should know how to read too, right? If they don't know how to read, what are we going to do? We're going to teach them, right? Or the student should be able to figure this stuff out on their own. It's only obvious. Or I shouldn't have to repeat myself. How many people have heard comments like that throughout your career? I have too. So we do want kids to be able to um, you know, learn that. So the question is, how do we teach behavior? I'm going to give you two options. You tell me how you teach behavior. Simon's got you. Come on. Yeah. Yay! You're almost down. Come on. Good girl. Yay! Good job.
All right, you knew it was gonna happen there, right? So the question is, how do you teach behavior? Is it the first way? Small baby steps, constantly modeling, practicing, encouraging, praising kids who are making those baby steps in the right direction? Or is it the other way? Just do it, you should know how to do it. We've been doing this since August, right? So you need to think about that as we continue with this great uh, approach here when we talk about the STOIC acronym. Behavior managers like you and me, intervention specialists, know that we got to do a lot of TMFing. We got to do a lot of TMFing. We got to teach, we got to monitor, model what we're looking for, and we got to give feedback, right? And a lot of our colleagues already said that in our chat box. But the bottom line for our classroom, for our tough kid, whatever that looks like and sounds to you, consequences have their place, as I said earlier. But when we teach, model, and provide feedback, that has more of an impact for changing behavior. It takes time and energy and enthusiasm. And again, I think that's kind of the whole idea. Telling a kid what to do, there's no teaching, modeling, or providing feedback. And again, that's kind of what we want to keep in mind as we continue, again, just skimming the surface about the T and stoic. Most of us are very familiar with the I do, we do, you do approach. We learned that in undergrad about how to teach academics. It's the same with behavior, right? How we walk in the room, how we leave the room. What if you don't, if you don't have a pencil? If he's bothering you, what, what do we talk about what to do? I'm going to show you. We're going to practice it and oh, so on and so on. So again, we always want to make sure we're doing those type of things in the right way uh, to move forward. So teaching, obviously, through modeling, providing feedback, examples and non-examples, that's kind of what we're looking for. And again, we need to spend a lot more time on that. The O in Stoic is pretty much self-explanatory, observe and monitor, right? And we know that as educators that we got to constantly inspect what we expect. So everything that you put into place since August has to be constantly inspected. How you do that formally or informally is totally up to you. But if you want that stuff to occur, it constantly has to be inspected, right? So we're talking about good supervision here. Here's a teacher who works in the middle school. He has hall duty. How's he doing? He's not doing so good, is he? He's got his head down and different things like that. So we know as educators, as good observers, we got to constantly move about the room. We want to interact frequently with students as much as we can in a positive way, constantly scanning the room. So me glancing at your eyes, your handshakes, your thumbs up, your raised hand, that's helping me kind of get the majority of our folks, again, doing what I want them to do during the short hour together. Observing, monitoring is so important. There's a little adage uh, in the behavior management literature about the teacher's desk. Have you ever heard this one? There's two times when a teacher should use their teacher desk. Once before the kids come in the morning and the second time at the end of the day after they leave. Did you ever hear that one? No? What does that imply? I gotta be on my feet, right? As much as I can. Easier said than done. It doesn't mean you can't sit down. But the bottom line is educators who are up and about basically can support what they put into place. They could guide kids. We could spend more time interacting with kids. We could head off and prompt misbehavior before it occurs, okay? And we do know that educators like you and me know how to walk backwards because we know we got to be good supervisors, right? So having your back to the kids, depending on your grade level, the amount of support that group needs is something you got to keep in mind. As a young educator working with emotionally disturbed kids at the age of 22, I had my back to the kids many times. And you know what they were doing behind my back? God only knows, right? But I didn't know that. I need to be taught that. How many people need to be more good observers and walk around the room in the classroom? From Good for you. I really appreciate that. When you do something like that, you're establishing what's called withitness. A teacher like you and me, who is aware of what's going on, knows what time the clock says, where are we on their schedule, knowing who's on task, who's off task, you know, has withitness. As I said earlier, when I was a young teacher, I was without it. I was big time without it. I was oblivious to it. It took me a long time to develop with itness, to be able to get a pulse of exactly what's working and what's not working in my room and things like that. By show of hands, how many people are on the journey to have with itness in their classroom, to be with it? More power to you. Good for you. For all our newer people 
uh, moving in that direction. Uh, so keep in mind, that's kind of what we're talking about here. So there's some things, uh, obviously, on our checklist that could look in that particular way. The I in Stoic talks about interacting positively. We're not going to spend too much time on this, but it's very, very clear. Teachers like you and me, we have good connections with our kids, right? We spent August connecting, connecting, connecting with our kids. Kids are more likely to do what you want them to do if you're connected with them. And when I use the word relationship or connected, I'm not saying, hey, come over to my house on Friday. Let's watch a Hulu series together. I'm talking about, I know who you are. You know who I am. I know your brothers and sisters. I know what type of music you're into and so on and so forth. And again, relationships are so, so important. And we know that most of us are really, really good at that. And that's kind of the whole idea when we talk about the I and stoic. So how we ever, you know, develop relationships, how we greet kids, how we praise kids, how we reinforce kids, uh, the words that we use uh, to make sure that we spend more time telling kids what they're doing well than what they're not doing well. Those are the things that really, really make a difference. Because the bottom line is the more you connect with kids, the less you correct. Easier said than done. I'm not trying to be sugarcoat any of this stuff. But we got to make sure that you and I spend more time noticing what kids are doing well than what they're doing wrong. Noticing more about what they're doing well than what they're doing wrong. By show of hands, how many people are good noticers about what the kids are doing in relation to your classroom rules and directions? Good for you. How many people are on a journey to be a good noticer? Good for you as well. And again, it's a work in progress, right? And that's kind of hard you know, to work on as well. So again, we want to make sure we recognize kids as well. When we talk about praise comments, reinforcement comments, acknowledgement comments, see how I'm not using the word reward because I'm not a big fan of that. We got to make sure we praise kids and reinforce them. Uh, sometimes using their name more often is something we got to keep in mind. And we got to make sure good praise is not embarrassing. We don't want a situation that looks like this. During the spelling lesson, you're going to be working in just a minute. But Nate, I've got to tell you, oh, I am so excited. You're following directions. You're keeping your eyes on me. You are really doing what you need to be doing. I have to say this is like the best I have ever seen you. Pay attention during class. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, boy, that kid's in big trouble later. How many people know adults who have a hard time taking a compliment? I do. What about a kid? Is that, is that honey's goals and uh, objectives? Learn how to take a compliment? So I always say by the month of October, we should know which kids in our class could take a public praise comment and which kids in our class need to take a private praise comment. Does that make sense? Because I don't want to embarrass anybody. I don't want to be embarrassed either. So that's something to keep in mind. As we finish up our few minutes together, obviously the C in Stoic talks about correcting fluently, right? And when we talk about correcting fluently, we got to constantly reflect upon how we correct kids who are not doing what they need to do. Some of our ways, and again, I'm being very general, are very archaic, such as the picture that you see there on the screen. I mean, who gives writing assignments anymore, right? That's as old as that sweater in that first video of that lady from the 80s or something, right? So we want to make sure that when we think about correction procedures, how we come across is very, very important. When we correct kids, do we keep it brief? Are we consistent day in and day out as we are on Monday morning to Friday afternoons? Are we calm with our voice and our body when we're correcting that kid who's not doing what we need to do? Okay. Do we do it immediately as best as can? Do we do it respectfully, even though we didn't like it when that kid said, F you, Mr. Stacko? right? Again, um, you know, we're not robots here. And in a perfect world, if we can, we want to try to do it semi-privately. Even though everyone knows I'm, I'm nailing this kid by going up to him for his inappropriate behavior, I want to try to create the illusion that I'm having a private discussion with him. So again, those are the, some of the big ideas when we look at correction procedure just to start. And um, obviously, a lot of educators like you and me are constantly working towards uh, establishing what we call a menu of corrective procedures. So if I came up to you and said, how do you correct misbehavior? You want to have a general menu. Well, I give verbal reprimands. I, I have kids reteach the behavior. I have them do positive practice. 
I have them lose a privilege. You want to have a general answer. And some of these things that you see plastered on that screen is kind of the whole idea what I'm talking to. So again, we went through this information very quickly. Um, and uh, I know that's kind of a, a hard to do in an hour, but the bottom line is to be a good classroom manager, we're going to have some setbacks on our journey. There's no doubt about it. We don't learn this stuff overnight or in undergrad. So we got to give ourselves plenty of time to get there. So think of where you are on that stoic checklist, praise yourself for all the great things that you're doing, and kind of give yourself some mini goals of what you want to accomplish each and every uh, semester that you're working at the building. The kids will tell you what's working and what's not working. So bring the kids along, right? They will always tell you what's working or not working. And if you're not getting the behaviors that you want, you got to teach and practice, teach and practice ad nauseum, okay? So I want to thank each and every one of you for paying attention to me for a quick hour. And I'm going to quickly throw it back to Stephen and uh, we'll go from there. Yes, thank you very much, Tom. That was uh, a lot of information in a short period of time. I actually found myself acting like a participant and really kind of introspectively looking at how things were when I was a teacher or just my interactions with my own children at home. Um, so I do appreciate your message today. It was very clear, concise, and I think there's a lot of tools and things that people um, can think about. I encourage you guys to look at that stoic checklist as well, um, kind of intermittently, maybe quarterly uh, at the semester breaks, things like that, and just kind of measure your growth as you know, you all know, and especially in special ed world, that management of progress and monitoring that stuff is, is so crucial to success. So uh, I want to thank Tom uh, for his time today and his message, as well as all the participants who came back for this second session. Uh, we are Certainly glad to see everyone that came back. Keep in mind the next session is uh, November 14th and the focus of that will be around uh, specially designed instruction uh, and data collection. Uh, if you have any follow up questions, um, Tom is on our website with his contact information as well as you guys, uh, most of you have my contact information. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Don't be a stranger if there's anything between, you know, now and then you have questions about or need support on, uh, that is what we are here for. So thank you. Thank you guys all for your time today and wishing you, um, especially younger elementary with the Halloween season coming up, the uh, sugar is definitely going to be on full um, effect. Uh, but so good luck with that. And we will see you in November. Take care. Thank you guys. Bye, everybody. Have a great weekend, everybody. Good to see you.